I don't have an ambition to be worth a billion. So I knew I needed to be a different person and become someone totally different to achieve what I wanted to achieve. I could retire now if I wanted to, and I could live a moderately good life off my investments or the money I've got now. Most journeys are probably a five to ten year journey and a five to ten year investment in your own growth to get there. I always believe that your path's written for you, but there's always doors you have to go through, and if you take one bad turn, then it might lead to another. That's why meditation and awareness is key in having that conscientiousness. All billionaires get divorced. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, like yeah, Jeff, Jeff, Be- Bezos, Jeff like Bezos, got Gary bo- Vaynerchuk, like yeah. all of them do. Everything you believe in your heart, if you're telling someone now what to do, would be get your money right first, get them, get the wealth first. Yeah, like happiness can come as a byproduct of like great wealth. I needed to be around other inspiring entrepreneurs that were either the same level as me or ahead of me, and I needed to be in an environment that would make me happy every day. Quick one before we jump into this podcast, do me a solid favor, hit that like button, hit subscribe, and drop a comment below this video. If you're looking to remove images, videos, search results, or fake accounts online, go to contentremoval.com. But don't take my word for it. Here's on Mosey. Frank, you're a fucking legend. I just saw this. Layla also thinks you're a legend, which in my mind means you're... <laughs> which, also, which means you're a double legend in my mind. If you get my wife to think you're a legend, then you're, you're extra cool in my mind. Dude, thank you so much, genuinely. That was um, such a pain. Welcome back to the Frankie Lee Podcast. And today, guys, you can see... We are in a new location, we are in Dubai, the setup's gone to another level, and I have a very, very epic guest today, Mr. Blackwell, James Blackwell, owner of two seven-figure companies, and he's built one in the recruitment space, one in the online education space. Mate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Welcome to your apartment, and welcome to the new setup, what do you reckon? Yeah, I love the setup. Yeah, mate, honestly, it's it's, it's good, mate, and it's good. But mate, I think where I want to take this one today is I want to... Obviously, you're in Dubai, and obviously, we've sat here on the palm. We're looking out now. It's it's abundant views where wherever we look. But it didn't start like this for you, obviously. Like, obviously, born in Newcastle. Talk to me. Talk to me in like your journey and obviously find entrepreneurship. So, what was it like for you going through school and everything like that? Yeah. So, um, taking it back to when I first started, um, like when I was at school, I was okay at school. Like, I wasn't really uh, academic as such. And I think um, over time in my school years, I sort of been more naughty as such. Uh, so I, I love playing football. So most of the time was took with sports and, and playing football at a, at a decent level. And then um, then when I started like 15 years old, like I started, that was when I had like paper rounds. And then I had like, I worked in a corner shop on the weekends to earn more money. And then, uh, then I started off just hustling. So I was always buying and selling things, sweets, pop at school, as, as lots of entrepreneurs do. And then, um, yeah, started my uh, career, like, as soon as I left uh, school at 16, I worked as an apprentice in a car garage, and then uh, just had, like, two, three jobs at a time, just always trying to earn money. So always trying to flip things, so I've tried all sorts from... Trying to hustle, just to, just in the normal English way, I think, I think we all have that little yeah. bit of bread into us, don't we? Yeah, buying and selling, like, stuff of eBay, whether it was doing clean, easy catalogs, where you would drop them off at the door and try and get orders and try and make commission that way. Um, and then I, like, I started, uh, buying and selling cars, like when I was 17, that's when like I first started like my real hustle as it were. Uh, so I started off, uh, going to car auctions and then I would buy a car and put it on my mum's drive and just clean it up and market it up. So I would buy one for like maybe five, 600 pounds and then try and sell it for like 900 pounds, a thousand pounds. And then I used to just keep doing that. Um, and that like built up a good, uh, little bit of cash, um, on my first little venture and then I suppose obviously once you'd gone through school you come out you started to play pro football didn't you you started to be in the youth I, academies or yeah the youth so teams. I played like when I was younger like from when I was like 14 to 16 17 and then um I still sort of played like semi-professional uh queen of the south in Scotland and then played like trials at Bournemouth uh Peterborough um in Newcastle when I was younger but I think the difference between the dedication of the sport and football, I, I just loved football, but I, I wasn't uh, dedicated to it as I was business. I just always wanted to be a business uh, entrepreneur, which is weird. Like there's, there's pictures of me back when I was like 10 years old with a suitcase and a full suit um, saying that I'm going to be a millionaire running down like my grand's garden. So like it was always instilled in me like from an early age that business was like my passion as opposed to like being a footballer. What was what was the most attractive thing about that kind of life to you then? Back then, I think from an early age, my dad was uh, like a sales director, and he worked in a in a company where 
my godfather at the time was like the owner of at this company and on the weekends I used to always ask my dad can I can I come to the business I wanted to see an office and and I remember being around a big boardroom table with like uh the guy that ran the business and he, he was like this big powerful figure and I think that like seeing that early on was like the aspiration because he he's the one that had big houses and drove big car, like nice cars yeah so you, and so I was like that must be the route to go down so from a young age and you kind of identified that with business came wealth that you could actually go and purchase things. You could actually go and move, move your life further forward. So you kind of, did you, did you kind of know at that point then that obviously swapping your time for money in the, in the, in the job wasn't really your, your route to success. Yeah. But I would also say like, uh, it didn't happen overnight. So even when I was like 18, 19, I was, what business is like now with the online space, it's a lot easier to get rich in the last five or 10 years than it's ever been. Like, I think we're similar age. So when we grew up, it was harder to even get business funding. Like when I started my first venture coffee shop, even getting funding for that, you couldn't, um, you couldn't really make money online as like how you can do it now. So back then it was, I was still stuck in the nine to five matrix as it were for a long time until I was probably uh, 27 when I like really kicked off with my recruitment agency, which we'll come on to. Uh, But before that, I was always trying to hustle and, have two jobs or buy and sell things, but it was very hard to to get out of it at the start. So did you get into the kind of sales role in recruitment first then for yourself? Is that, yeah. that's kind of like the, the job that took you on to having your own recruitment agency? Yeah, so taking it back, like when I was 21, I got an opportunity when I was buying and selling cars, I made up enough money, I think it was like 15, 20,000 pounds at the time. Uh, started with 1,000 pounds. And then I got this opportunity to take over this coffee shop, uh, local to me. And... Uh, at the time that was a great opportunity but I didn't know anything about business then and I was just thrown in the deep end big rent big rates having employees and uh, so I would open that shop up every day 6am I'd have to go to the cash and carry put all the stock in the shop uh, and I ran that business for two years and it was quite successful I mean it, it probably turned over maybe half a million pounds a year back then and but it was just hard no there was no one to help or guide me there like in terms of not just mentors but uh, there's no banks that would loan you any money. So every time we would get money through the till each week, I'd have to go with that money to the cash and carry and buy the stock to fill the shop up again. And it was just a constant cycle. And that at 21 years of age was like, it was a really good learning curve because that was my first failure. The business failed after two years and like I, I handed it back and like I did fail with that, but that was a really good lesson. Like one, two, like I didn't do enough research in terms of learning enough, like read enough books. Uh, follow enough people on YouTube, get mentors. Uh, but it, it stood me in good stead for business early on because that failure, then I worked, I ended up getting a job at BMW selling cars. And I sold cars for like four or five years. And again, I was in that cycle of like every month you make some good commission, but then you spend the money again and you need to like yeah, earn money yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And I remember back in those days was, uh, I remember my grand actually lent me some money because uh, I would always get in debt. Like, living paycheck to paycheck and then it would be like those payday loans because I was trying to live a certain lifestyle and then I was getting stuck in the cycle on payday loans like for a, th- a few months and I, I was lucky like my grand back at the time borrowed me the money to get out of those payday loans because they can suck you in big time with the high interest rates and then after that I got a job in recruitment which I didn't know at the time was sales like it's, it was really high level selling yeah, because 100%. you're selling people's psychology and you're selling a career for them to move and also still trying to get a client on board as well. So like there's two dynamics there from a psychology perspective of like selling. And I remember at that time I didn't really have any money to my name and I had to take a pay cut from the car sales job to this recruitment job because it was starting as a pretty much a graduate again. And at 25, 26 years old, uh, that was quite hard to do because it was like going back to a basic salary of I think it was like £15,000 a year. I mean, no one can live off that. So I actually got into debt for around about £10,000 on a credit card and loans. But I knew that opportunity would give me meritocracy to earn. The more I put in, the more you get out in recruitment. So the more hours you put in, the more chance you have to make commission, to make sales, to make the money. So I did that for five years and I progressed all the way from uh, being a team leader to a manager, having shares in that business. And then, uh, yeah, that's when, before I just started my recruitment agency, my first uh a business venture so you actually bought shares within that business from no we got gifted them uh so like the top 50 performers from the organization got uh given these shares 
which was when they exited the company, you would have got a payout. So I was in a dilemma back then because by then, by the time I got those shares, the exit was supposed to happen within a year, 18 months. And I remember friends that were at a similar level to me there, they stayed on to get the shares, but I, I wanted to start my own thing. Like I was, by then I was into personal development very aggressively, like getting up at 5 a.m. every morning, listening to podcasts, listening to Grant Cardone, listening to Gary Vee, getting motivated. And I was just always wanting to start my own business. So by then I had a, I had like a decision to make. Basically, do I leave behind? It was a six-figure exit for me at the time, and that was like a lot of money, cash lump sum. Or do I stick my neck on the line and start my business now with no money? And that was the motivation to fuel me. I wanted to beat my friends that worked in the same uh, agency as me to earn more than them in the first year of my business starting up than getting it from an exit. So did so when you say obviously out earn them, you mean just out earn the exit fee? Yeah. The the fee would have been what two hundred k, probably like one hundred and fifty two hundred k. Yeah. So you, why is it then that you went down the route of not going down what normal people go down, which is like the sunk cost fallacy? They think because they've put in so much time into a business that they have to stay in that business to facilitate the growth. I mean, there's a lot of people that listen to this that are probably in jobs they don't like and they're staying in it because. They're, because they've been in it for five years or they've, they're, they're doing a sport career that they don't enjoy anymore and they want to do business, but they're staying in the sport career because that's what they know. So how, what, what's your advice then on, on breaking what I call the sunk cost fallacy? Yeah, but it, it is a cost. Like, you've got to take that risk. And I think for me, it was um, I knew it was a sunk cost bias in terms of, oh, well, I've worked there five years. The, the, the pound's going to come. It's going to come. Because then it got kept, kept, kept getting pushed back every six months. And I was like, I was already like, I'd already had a future vision of like what I wanted and where I wanted to be. And my current reality was just so far away from that. And I went through a difficult time then because I remember that uh, year was a really tough year for me. And it was the first time ever that I experienced like anxiety as such. And I actually had like a panic attack, which was mental because I was like, never happened to me before. And I was like, what is actually going on? And when I had like personal mentors, I actually realized that it was, um, it's where your current reality and your future dreams and goals are so far apart like because I was listening to all these multi-millionaire entrepreneurs and everything else but I was just going back to my job earning 50 60k a year and with the hope of getting this pound but like the income wasn't matching like where my dreams wanted to be and the, the current reality and it was so far apart my brain and my subconscious mind couldn't attach me being all the way here to where I was so that's why sometimes you've got to have a little bit of shorter goals that you can work towards that you're building towards as yeah. opposed to like it's all stretched I, mean, I know we had this chat off air about uh, how well your podcast doing and how well you're doing in business but then when you're around people that are even doing more money than you and more successful it, it creates that good anxiety and it's like shit like yeah. I'm a little bit behind I want to be here yeah but I'm currently here but like it's still going to take a little bit of work and it's just managing that within your um subconscious mind to say it's okay Frankie it just takes patience it takes time yeah it's, and if you could look back say in five years time and you know you're going to get there and you wish you could tell your younger self don't worry Frankie it's all in place it's just step by step then you'll probably be a little bit more calmer in those situations and you wouldn't have those anxious thoughts or that push yeah it's hard for me, from a point of view, is like when I when I look at people like yourself that are doing bits, that are in my friend network and that are doing bits on all different levels, and it's like, say, we go down and look at the cars, and I'm thinking, and in my head I'm thinking, wow, like one of these cars is X amount of money, and I've put that, nearly that much money into the, into the podcast, right? <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? I'm like, mate, you, why, why didn't you buy the car? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, sometimes you think that to yourself. You're like, you know what I'm saying? Like, not, not that not that I want the car more than I want what we're doing now, but it's just, it just kind of subconsciously in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, wow, maybe I should be further ahead than what I am. I think that's what we all struggle with. Sometimes we all think that we should be further away. I'm sure it happens to you as well, like in terms of like when you're surrounded by the amount of wealth and abundance that you're now surrounded by, it's hard to even think about what you've achieved because you want to just achieve more i mean i went and sat down there with sam i was sat there on the palm and he's in he's, he's got a beautiful penthouse in the palm and i was talking to him about how well he's done and he's talking about mate i want to build the palm mm. and that's the mentality mm -hmm. that people have here yeah. how how is like just skipping forward a, a step how has dubai changed your mindset from from that from those english days like to, to create that abundance that separation yeah it's a really good point so 
I think like when I made my first one or two million in the UK, like it got to a point in my current environment, I had achieved a lot. And I think when you grow up in different towns or cities, uh, I wanted to be in a in a different environment that really pulled me up even further. And I think you need to go as you go through stages in life. You need to make sure your environment environment's like number one for me in terms of like building success. And not everyone is blessed with having a good environment at the start. But as you work towards it, you always got to keep working towards like pushing your peer group, so upgrading your peer group all the time, the people who you hang around with, yeah. the environment that you're in. But in Dubai, like I'm, I'm nothing here compared to there's like billionaires, there's yeah. like people that are worth 100, 200, 500 million. And I think it's a, it's okay where I am now because I know I can aspire. It's definitely pushing me to want more, and to know that like I could hopefully have a yacht one day private chat like it, it's it's pushed me to that other thing where i'm i'm not comfortable because you could easily get comfortable in the money when you make say you have 10 million or where i'm at now is i could i could retire now if i wanted to and i could live a moderately good life off my investments or the, the money i've got now and the businesses i've got but i would i do want more like i do want a, a even better life and i think it dubai definitely inspires you to have that Definitely, for me, I still want a balance of health, wealth, love, happiness. I don't want to just be the richest man in the graveyard. I don't have an ambition to be worth a billion. Uh, I, but I, but now I'm so calm. When I first started my entrepreneurial journey, I was adamant I'm going to be worth a hundred million. Like all of my, um, all of my vision boards would say that. All of like uh, the words I would keep repeating back to me all of the time was always a hundred million, hundred million. And then when you look back, it's like, why? What would you do with that money? Like, how would your life change? And I know there's a study that says, like, after you earn, I think, over £120,000 a year, £150,000 a year, that, that, that increases happiness to a certain point. But after yeah. that time, the happiness, like, wealth just gives you more choices. Like, I've got so much more freedom. So that definitely contributes to the happiness factor. But I definitely don't want to be slaving away to get to £200 million. But now I'm so comfortable knowing what I was explaining to you before in five years' time, if you could look back, and tell Frankie that you're going to be okay and you're going to be really successful and get to that money, you'll be all right. Because I've made a certain amount now, I know that the 100 million is going to be there within five years. Yeah, yeah, And, yeah, and there's yeah. no pressure on it. I don't care. I don't care if I fall short and get 60. I just know over time, because I've seen the compound effects of uh, where I've got to now and the, the curve that just happened, then I just know that that's going to be around the corner. But I just, I just need to be patient with it. I don't put too much importance on it. How much importance do you put on like the vision boards and stuff like that? So, so now when I look back of what got me successful, definitely the vision board because where we are now in this uh, apartment and I'm blessed to, to live in, that was on my vision board uh, about seven, eight years ago. So when I was saying, I, I used to listen to say Grant Cardone back in the day yep. when I first started out. On my vision board was uh, him and his wife and his kids on his private jet is one of them and then his Miami beachfront apartment that he lives on. But back then I couldn't understand. I was like, maybe I wouldn't go to Miami, but I want to live on a beach and I want to live in an apartment like that with sky views. But I didn't even know about Dubai then. But I put it out in the universe on my vision board, then all of a sudden I'm living here and I would never have even attached that like reality to what was to in To what you're living now. Yeah. It is amazing because obviously I've seen the power of vision boards for myself because the, where I was living in Australia and the apartment that I had and the lifestyle that I had was all part of that vision from ever since I was well I built vision boards later on but I remember saying to my friend in the in the, in the geography class when the Gold Coast first came on the radar I said that I was going to live there and I remember that I was about 14 15 years old and then obviously you end up when I, re- I realized when I when I was living there at like 25 26 that that was part of my vision and I'd been manifesting that so to speak cooking it up in my mind for a long time and I wasn't taking no for an answer very very powerful thing if you can convince yourself before it's your reality that it's going to be your reality isn't it mm-hmm. it's like and i there's parts of my life that i have that conviction and there's parts of my life where i'm working on having that conviction and i think a rounded entrepreneur like yourself someone who's achieved so much is you've put it into place in every every area of your life your health your wealth your happiness to be able to facilitate this growth mm. You know, is, 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 would you say that's kind of along the right, right lines in terms of like how it's, how it's come yeah, through? I would say like vision boards were important. Affirmations. So 
when we talk about affirmations, like writing down your affirmations of like who you want to become, and because who you are now is not who you need to become to in order to get to your next goal. Yeah, right. So you need to change and evolve as a human. So you talk about upgrading to version two point or Frankie or whoever. So I knew I needed to be a different person and become someone totally different to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And once you've got that perception and understanding, then once you've got the vision board and then you've got the affirmations of who that new person needs to be, and then you program your subconscious mind into, like I would listen to affirmations every single day. So basically what I did was I wrote down, I think I had like 70 or 80 affirmations about James Blackwell, you are a multimillionaire. James Blackwell, you live on the beachfront, you live in the sun every day. You're, you're blessed with like full health. Like all of these things sound to the average person is like, oh, it d- doesn't work. But it does work over time. Like, because I remember if I look back before, like, I had big success, was uh, I would listen to affirmations every single morning when I got up. I recorded the affirmations and I play them on my phone every morning when I was in the shower. It was 15 minutes. And it was my voice programming my subconscious mind about all of these. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Because if it's not worked, if it's not your voice, yeah, it needs to be your voice. It needs to be your voice, doesn't it? Because if it's not your voice, then it is hard to for your brain to take it on as as the truth. So you constantly playing back your own recording every day. Yeah, and I've still got it, and it's. uh, But I don't listen to it anymore. But that definitely all of those tiny little things that I've done over the last uh, four or five years have definitely helped me get to this stage. So what were some of the limiting beliefs that you had to overcome then in order to to push through, you know, that that whole stage? Mm. There must have there, there must have been a time in the in the UK between obviously starting your business and you making your first couple of million. There's obviously how long how long a gap was that? Probably like 3 3 to 4 years. 3 to 4 years, right? And in that 3 to 4 year gap, in that window, there's a lot of um, personal development, a lot of self-realization a lot of new habits that have to be learned and managed in order to facilitate that growth like what are some of those things yeah because it's hard because you've got to do that working on yourself as well as working on a business so it it is even when people say work-life balance and everything else it's 60 70 hours a week not necessarily working in the business you need to do i think personally 20 hours a week working on yourself like even today like i still do four or five hours like i'll read watch youtube learn from mentors 10 masterminds, I'm always keen to learn all of the time. And I think that's what separates most people is like people aren't putting in that, they dollar go out on the weekends or, or go and party or go and see friends. Like you've got to make sacrifices. So I would say that the, like the daily habits was, uh, I was getting up early, I was uh, training, I was uh, drinking healthy green smoothies, all the little edges, meditating every single day. So coming back, I was mentioning when I first was going to start my business, I had some anxiety issues. So I started meditating every day and I did that. I've done that consistently now for nearly eight years and meditation has definitely helped just keep me more grounded, more calm. Uh, I started doing a little bit of yoga back then. I don't do yoga as much like now at all, but definitely meditation, uh, journaling all of the time. As you see, I have notebooks around the apartment all over. So I would, I would notebook and journal because you have so much, you post, your brain processes so much information and there's so much like things around business, ideas, strategies, things you need to do, how you're feeling. It's very important to journal. Like if you get those thoughts out, then it frees your mind and cleanses your mind and empties it out more. And then you put them on paper. So like journaling, meditation, affirmations, uh, eating as healthy as you can, getting good quality sleep, surrounding yourself with good people. So you are the average of the five people you hang around with most and making sure you're hanging around the right people. If not in your local area, joining masterminds or going to events, uh, being around some some other people that are like ambitious like you, like those are important things. And sacrificing not going out and drinking all of the time and partying for sure, uh, and then reading. If, if if people are in a job though and they need to obviously get they, they obviously want to move to where you are, but obviously there's such a like you say a big a big separation from from where you are now to where they potentially are listening to this. They might be in a job. One of the first things that I noticed changed my life was when I got into sales. So I went from 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 an inner job as a carpenter and joiner to in now a sales role, now having to sell. The first time I tried to sell, obviously collapsed on my ass and this, that, and the other. The second, the second place I went after that was top salesperson because of the lessons that I'd learned previously and how I adapted. Mm-hmm. But but I, th- I I kind of advise people from my perspective is like the first before you go out of the 
try and be the entrepreneur and trying to everything. The sales is the first role that you should go into. Yeah, but you need sales as like probably the number one skill as a business owner. Because no matter what business you start, you're the salesperson. So if you don't know how to sell and get in front of customers, generate leads, close deals, then you're going to struggle in business. Because you see a lot of these uh, products or SaaS companies, the reason why most of them fail isn't the technology or the product behind it. They've got... They're kind of getting in front of users and kind of get people to buy the product. Yeah. And that's because they're selling. And where most shitty products or mid-level products do really well because they've got a great sales strategy and great marketing. Sales and marketing are the like two core skills that they don't teach in schools, which is one of the reasons why we're stuck in because if you, yeah, it's if, like if, if you're good at either one of those, you, you 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 can facilitate your growth for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, yeah. You'll always make money. Because it's a top even if it, even if it's just a top skill that you apply to other people's businesses, you can you can take positions in other people's businesses because you can apply the leverage of, of the skill that you have. Yeah. I.e. you can have you can be a, a chief marketing officer and, and you can get shares in a business because you're that good at driving customers for the sales team to sell to do you yeah, know what I mean? sales is number one skill that every entrepreneur needs to make and if someone's in a nine-to-five job now i'd recommend like learning sales on the side and then you could also have a side hustle of sales like you could be a remote closer like for high ticket sales programs you could do a lot of things part-time as a salesperson if you wanted to or you would just move from where your career is now into a potential sales role uh, that's what i would definitely advise people that are I can't really get out. But also what I would be doing is if someone has ambitions to start their own business but are still working a nine to five, they need to be doing the personal development. So if you do that every single day for one or two years and then you have become a better version of yourself and you've got adaptable skills, then you're in a better position to like start up a business. So because also like when you want to have mentors, a lot of people ask, well, how do you get mentors? So I was lucky when I started my business, I would go and network on the golf course, uh, take people to football matches, go meet uh, entrepreneurs and business owners for coffees. And they would all do that for free. But that's because you have to bring value back to them. So because I had good knowledge in marketing, uh, technology, sales, like I could bring something valuable to them and teach them something that they could implement in their business that was a good value exchange. Or because I was learning from, I would read lots of autobiographies of different billionaires, multimillionaires. So I'd, I'd learn how they act like how they think, how they process, how they are successful. So I was just instilling all those habits in me that I could then have, uh, that I could share with other mentors that could help me in return. Yeah, and you're, you're obviously bringing something to the table when you do that. But a lot of people, that when, they think of, when they think of the word networking, which is, which is a word I hate because essentially you're just building relationships with people, which is what you should be doing. Yeah. They, when, they, when the term networking is used, networking is used from a point of view as like, okay, how can I meet that person to go and take some value away from them rather than how can I give value to that person without any expectation of value in return? I think that's the true art of building friendships and, and why, and you know, from you will always do business with your friends or you should always do business with your friends because, you know, that's one thing I've learned off, off a lot of top entrepreneurs. They, they do business in their friendship groups, which is how they accrue mass amounts of wealth and capital. I mean, you've only got to look at people like Andrew Tate and his war room and the deals that go on in there and other people that have these masterminds, masterminds that you're probably in and, and, and you've, you've probably been a part of or set up yourself. Would you say that people have to bring bring the value but not, truly expect all, all these things in return all the time you know sometimes you're going to be able to be bringing value but you, you just can't something you plant this year might not f- grow fruit for another three years you can't reap it straight away i think it's the the modern day society with social media amazon prime now everything now 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 unfortunately i think the younger generation because I, I mentor a lot of them in, in my programs as well they expect things a lot quicker and I haven't got the patience, and they don't think in terms of when they're building a relationship with someone, they're going in for an ask straight away instead of, here, I want to bring value to you first, and then knowing, like, it could, it'll come back in return. They're not very clever in terms of articulating. If they want something from someone, you need to give first to get back and don't expect anything in return. And then normally what would happen nine times out of ten, that person will give back anyway because you set the expectation or intention, but you didn't ask what are some of the things then that people you think that, that can give to give to an entrepreneur? Like if if they if they want to network with us or, or build a relationship with a successful entrepreneur, it's obviously for me. It's like I can bring 
a podcast to the table or I can I've got other skills in my arsenal that I can bring to the table to be able to facilitate the relationships that I have. But if you're someone in a nine to five job who wants to facilitate those relationships, what are some of the types of things that they could bring to the table where they add value to that person and kind of can facilitate that relationship? So little things I used to do was I would meet with local uh, business owners in where where I'm from and where my business was starting up. And what I would do is I'd lead in value, like we specialised in technology recruitment in the northeast of England. So I would be part of a lot of those communities and understand what was going on in that network. So I could give them value news, which companies are bought, which companies, who's moved where, like all of that intel yeah. information. And then I'd always lead, I would always go with the book. So it's a, it's a, there's a book called Giftology about that, but like starting the relationship off with a gift, even though it costs you maybe £10 for that book. And I would explain why I've gave them, presented them that one, the story behind it, and that I've read it, and I think they would really enjoy it. That goes so much a long way because they feel already in your debt that you're like you've given them something. People don't often buy people gifts, and people feel good when you get, give them a gift. And it doesn't matter the value of it; it's just the intention and like the actual thought that counts. So I used to always that was one of my tricks was I would always give someone a book, and every time I'd meet them for a coffee or lunch or whatever, I'd say thank you so much for the time. Look, I was really thinking of you with this book. I think you'll enjoy it because of X, Y, Z. Enjoy it. The reason I give books is because no one throws away a book. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the Keep first thing. I always, write, the I always write a note on the inside of it, mm. and people always remember who gave them that book. Yeah. And even if they never read it, it doesn't matter. The fact is, they always remember who, who gave them it and where they were and then when they were given it, and the fact it sits on the shelf mm. and it looks back at them. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. you can... And if you, if not many you, people still do yeah, that, though. Yeah, it's, it's very a, rare. It's a, it's a good... I remember uh, I did a deal. I did a deal with a massive fitness company in australia and i gave the ceo of that company a book 100 percent. that that was that that on the on the sales meeting of closing that contract That's good. and it and there was a lot of thought that went into what book and why i was recommending that book mm. to because i obviously you have to do a lot of due diligence so you obviously know what part of stage that company's in mm-hmm. and then what book to buy that person predicated on where they're at do you know what I'm saying? So you got to look at when you buy people gifts, you don't look at what worked for you, look at where they're at in their journey and then buy something that facilitates that. You know, if you think someone's got some, ang- so you've just told me about anxiety, well, I'd be like, right, so I'm going to buy them a book on meditation and how that can help them solve anxiety, right? Not, I'm not going to buy him a book on, on how to get rich when he's already got that sorted. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's little things, it's little things like that, that people yeah. don't, don't, the nuances because you, because a lot of, you can buy gifts, but there's nuances in how you buy gifts, and I think you've got Con- conscientiousness. Yeah. Like, not everyone has that, and that's how I hire my team. Is like, have they got high high levels of conscientiousness? Which is known, like you mentioned about like the anxiety or meditation. You just need to know that in your brain and think. Like n- nine times out of ten, most people won't think about that, and then think that should be the type of book to get them. They would naturally just think get a yeah. business book or, or whatever. Yeah. So like, not everyone has got that skill. And I think that's just, I don't know if you're born with that or not, but I think from experience of hiring and firing a lot of employees, some people have just got it in terms of being conscientious. I, I do think having spoken to a lot of people with success like yourself and other people, founder of Reebok, Paul Richardson from Gymshark, Al Barrett, these people like yourself, they are, they are not, they are obsessed with the detail in terms of like the detail of how you how you'd buy a book or how I'd buy a book, everyone everyone who who's, who's having very success in life is always obsessed over the little details and nuances. Mm-hmm. And to have that much, you need to have a little bit of nous that not the whole society has got. But you, but it but you can learn that ability. Mm-hmm. You just have to think about putting other people first and what you can bring to the table before you start asking for things. And a lot of people have a habit of DMing me and telling me that they're gonna be on the podcast in seven years and or be in the podcast in three years and all this stuff and i'm like yeah, but how does that add or, or add value to the audience where you want to come and tell your story about how you've been successful that's not serving the audience that's not how people book guests and it's not how you operate in business is it so it's just these little nuances are things that i think people don't don't see when they send these kind of messages to people yeah. and it, that, that's what separates them from what they what they actually want to achieve which is just building a relationship a genuine relationship after you built got to that first couple of million in your business from the, the the sweat things, building it up, hiring your first employees, 
what, what was the point when you decided that even though that business was successful in England, what was the point when you decided, okay, I don't want to be based here. I need to go to Dubai now. I need that growth moment. Yeah, so when I set up my second business, the online education company in the mastermind, I did that like four or five years in my recruitment agency. So I'd done that for five years. And what you tend to find in business as well, there's a journey in, in life and there's different stages in your business career as well. And when you have... Uh, a baby that you started off like in, as your business that's yours blood sweat and tears started from like a kitchen table to scaling it to like two millionaire consistently with a great team you get a point where okay so do you do, do you go again after five years or do you want to start something fresh and I'd always wanted to help and inspire other people because that's what got me su- successful was learning from mentors and learning from other masterminds and online courses etc so that's when I built my online uh, course and mastermind and then that was that was taken off. So like in two years, it took off really well. I think now we've helped over 560 agency owners either get multiple six figures or seven figures in their agency. And that's from people from around the world, all over. And I knew there was a point when I was just, both businesses were making good money, but that education space was starting to take off even more. And there was a point when it was just like, you pay, I was paying so much tax. And it wasn't just that, it was in the environment I was at in uh, Newcastle, I wasn't getting to be around like inspiring people every day. It wasn't inspiring being in the place I was driving through. And it's from my hometown, so I respect it. But you drive through the shops, half of them are shut down. There's graffiti on them. Things, places are getting robbed. You're not in an environment where you're training your subconscious mind. It's all great having the affirmations and the vision board. But if you get to a certain level of yeah. success and the environment hasn't caught up with your success, that was the time to, like, you need to get out of here and move. And a lot of people end up staying and just, I could have just stayed and been comfortable, but I wanted to take, go things to the next level. So I knew I needed to upgrade my environment. A lot of people as well kill off everything from their old life in order, mm. successful people kill off everything in their old life to because they understand what got them there isn't going to get them okay, there. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that dawned on me about, must. I think it started to dawn on me about May, uh, May like last year, this year, but... um it definitely hit me about 30 days ago and I obviously decided to sell everything and leave Australia. Not because Australia is not abundant, not because it hasn't got opportunity, but because there needs, when you achieve certain levels in life and hit certain ceilings, you've got to radically lose everything about yourself and reinvent yourself. I mean, what parts of yourself did you feel that you had to lose in that moment to be able to come to Dubai? Yeah, comfort. So it was just the comfort zone of being around my family all of the time, my brothers, like a close bunch of friends and leaving my dog behind as well. Like that was a big sacrifice, but I knew that, uh, I needed to be around other inspiring entrepreneurs that were all either the same level as me or ahead of me. And I needed to be an environment that would like make me happy every day. So the sun, the environment as well, but things I've left behind is I'll be honest. I've, I haven't really kept in touch with many friends back home. I've probably got one, two friends. I could count on like one hand. But when I started being around more multimillionaire successful people, they've all have the same. They have a really tight group of friends. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that because you've been friends with someone for 10, 15 years, doesn't mean the next five or 10 years you're going to be best friends with them. You'll still hold them close in your heart, and but you just won't spend as much time with them or reply back or as, as fast and being able to have time. Because what happens when, you, especially in Dubai, I've found is I just have zero time. But between like one of my businesses and, and working on projects and then meeting other people, I, I've got a great solid friendship group here. I've probably have like 15, 20 people. And I would say like three or four very, very close friends that are very successful. And one best friend, Iman, that you've had on the show before, I would class him as one of my best friends. But we only met less than two years ago. But the friendship that we have is is like having a friend for the last 10, 15 years. Because we're yeah. at a similar stage in... Uh, success so i mean he's even more successful than me but in terms of our likes our traits our beliefs the people that we follow that where we want to go it's all aligned in its tunnel vision and i think as you upgrade your peer group you have got to be a little bit selective around the time that you spend with other people that have been friends in the past i'm not as active responding back and it's not being arrogant or ignorant it's just i haven't got the time because what you tend to find when you get more success more people reach out to you so you get more like there's, there's DMs, there's 
Slack messages every day, there's emails, there's text messages, there's WhatsApp, there's so many lines of communication. And when you're getting more successful, you need to keep your mind clear and you, you can't make too many decisions every day. So the most successful people will make two or three decisions a day. I think Jeff uh, Bezos is like his task is he makes three important decisions every day and that's him done for the day because you've got to be selective around, you can't just keep in touch with, if I was keeping in touch with everyone all of the time, yeah, I wouldn't get any work done. So you have got to be very selective. And I have, I have changed a lot as a person as well. I would say I'm version 3.0 of myself now. I need to evolve from James before he started his business to, to James Blackwell 2.0 to run his business. And 3.0, taking it from a couple of million to multi-millions, like it's evolving again. So, and then that comes with the peer group and the people that you hang around. Because you can have very, there's a lot more people in Dubai that I've managed to meet because everyone's congregated to one close area where everyone's 15, 20 minutes away and everyone's came with the same goal and has got very similar ambitions and goals and beliefs in life. And I think that's been very good uh, managing to move to Dubai here. I've been blessed with having a great friendship group. Yeah, and I like the fact of how when you move to Dubai, even though you have companies in other countries, because of the nature of the fact that you're physically based here you can you can obviously move around taxes a lot more efficiently in the in the countries that you even trade in yeah a majority of like my education companies run in dubai and in international so most of our clients are in the u.s canada australia and the uk but then my, my companies in in the uk are, are kept there separate and uh they just like still run without me day to day which is a beautiful thing i mean would you build another recruitment company in Dubai or anything like that along the track no I think like for me next is uh, I'm building a a SaaS uh, technology product uh, for uh, recruitment similar to what Iman's doing for or for yes similar to what he's done in his agencies um, I'm doing in for recruitment agencies in terms of like there's there's a lot of things that I can help with from my knowledge in the recruitment sector for the last 12 years and then mentoring other business owners in that sector for the last five i've got a good market there that i think a a certain product once we develop it i think is going to be very powerful and i think that's what takes you to uh, alex becker i don't know if you follow him yeah he he just recently sold hyros i think for 110 million million dollars dollars us and I, i i read one of his posts recently about how to go from eight to nine figures and like the business model I'm in now. So that was the thing. Like when I started my recruitment agency, that was vehicle one that got me to make my first million or two. Yeah. The second vehicle was my own education and packaging my IP and knowledge I gained from all of those years. So whether it was mindset, beliefs, uh, building systems, automation, growing a business, skill in the recruitment agency, all of these things I managed to package into a product and help. And that got like 500 people amazing results. And that vehicle can get you to eight figures. But to get to nine figures on an exit, like the majority of those businesses are like mainly SaaS companies now at the minute. So that's really been my mindset. Like my bigger goal to get the 100 million is going to be a SaaS exit probably in the next like four or five years. So what what would be the the set, the, 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 what would be the price point in terms of you charge for that software? And how many sales do you need for, to, to reverse engineer this end goal of 100 million exit? So with like SaaS, it's really different because it's just based on users. And as long as you keep the churn low and you've got good retention, then like the hardest thing sometimes for a SaaS product is you can build a good product, but I was saying at the start, if you can't sell it, then it's it's not worthless. It's worthless. But because I've already got the audience and I've already got the members in my community. You've got someone to sell to. Yeah. So as long as I make it right and how I, I practice what I preach in terms of what I teach, even just the members that I've got in my community and what I'll have over the next year or two, Let's say we've got a thousand members in there that are all paying a hundred dollars a month. That's like that's going to get us. If you, even if it got us an eight x multiple or a seven x multiple, that would get us into probably sixty seventy million on an exit. So that's the grand vision with that. Even if it came up short and it only got to like twenty or thirty, I would be happy with. But I think that's like the next long term strategy is going to be building that with a small niche community like. Even if you got a thousand users on a certain platform, and there was a strategic buyer there that wanted to buy it, 
then and it aligns it, with, it aligns with something that they can put it under an umbrella of another brand etc cetera, etc cetera. they could buy it as a feature to their existing SaaS product and include yeah. you into it which is what like hubspot do yeah they buy up so. they buy smaller SaaS products and plug them in to the back end and then throw it in as an extra feature for free mm. but it adds value and it adds users to the, to the system it's a, it's a great it's a great business model to get in but there's a there's a whole i listening to you talk about this there's a whole thing that i want to reiterate to the audience is the fact of like first you went into sales mm-hmm. that that taught you taught you something then you then you built bricks and mortar business that did recruitment you got to a couple of million then you thought right there's a that's not going to that vehicle's now not going to get me there so you go into online education space scale it to like you know multi millions that way now you're now now what do you have you have freedom of location freedom of time freedom of living so you can live where you want and now now because you've got that cash flow business the cash flow business in the UK the cash flow business with the online education that now facilitates you opening the doors to be able to even think about SaaS exactly so you cannot think about software as a service until you have facilitated the growth the way that you have. Yeah, I agree. Because you can't just get into SaaS. It's it's because I know it's gonna it's gonna be burning cash. It burns cash every month. But I know I can put two, three million into something. If I really believe in it, I know I've got the customer base and I make the product correct, then I know I've got the end goal of doing that and I, I would still be comfortable. So I can afford to take that risk. And yeah. Bootstrap it and self fund it. Whereas like most people that start SaaS would have to uh, get funding. And then before they know it by the exit, they've only owned ten percent of the company. Well, your your cash flow business funds the, the the software that you're building, and the software you're building is being sold to the users of of the agency products that you've already got. So it's a genius business model because it's self funded, and then se- it fills its own self up with users, and then they can recommend it to more users. Exactly, yeah. I just wanted people to get very clear on why you're going. Yeah, into because SaaS. if I didn't have the user base, then I probably still wouldn't do the SaaS company because it would be. Like building a sales team and getting it out to the product market and market it, like it would take even it would take twice as long. Yeah. All I need to do is build a product, build a tech team. And this is another thing. My recruitment agency is a tech recruitment agency. All we do is recruit software developers. So I know what I'm doing in terms of finding talent. So I can find the talent. Yeah. I've got the user base. Yeah. So I just need to put them together, make sure the product's correct, but I've got the twelve years of knowledge and IP in my head of what works and what doesn't work because I've tried and tested lots of software and tools. Um, so that blended together is like a, a perfect mix. But it is a journey. It's a stage that you, that yeah, you go through. So everything that you've just said there is 10 years. Yeah. So how, how important is it for people to understand then that, that most journeys are probably a 5 to 10 year journey and a 5 to 10 year investment in, in, in your own growth to get there? I mean, how, Yeah, but it's bang on. For, I would say 5 years is the time at least to make your first million. You could do it quicker, but like to build the foundations of like improving yourself because you get, you're going to go through ups and downs. There's going to be a lot of challenges and I think a lot of people quit or like don't manage to push through that. And I think I'm, looking back, I think, yeah, one and two were great for me when we first started the business because it was just me, my, my younger brother who I brought on when he was 17 and I taught him sales. So he just came in, learned sales and then now he runs my recruitment agency day to day and he's in six figures and he's happy and he's, he's doing really well. But then like year three, year four, when I started really good, I got more challenges because I hired too much and I learned from those mistakes. It cost me a lot of money. And I think over time, you'll always have challenges. I'm a big believer in energy in the universe Everything happens for a reason uh, in the quantum field and, and all of the neurons and energy. And I think everything's always a lesson. And it's like, what can I learn from this lesson? What is the world or the universe trying to teach me in this? And sometimes ev- I always believe that your path's written for you, but there's always doors you have to go through. And if you take one bad turn, then it might lead to another. And th- but there's always signs that you'll take back to check back and say, James, tune in. Are you in tune with everything? Because look what's happening. And a lot of people are so, sometimes so blinkered in the day-to-day. That's why meditation and awareness is key in having that conscientiousness because you, t- you can read the signs. Because I think everyone in life gets signs, but it's, sometimes they're not in tune with them. I think you need to be able to get quiet within yourself to be able to hear the gut. So yeah. if, we, if I can give people a bit of an insight into that, it's the fact of like, it was only when I got quiet that I realized that if I continue to live out my life in Australia in that moment, then I would live the same life next year as what I've lived this year, which don't get me wrong, is great, but that's not, that's not serving the listeners. That's not serving the podcast. That's not serving my greater vision to the, to the extent. So I have to come and I have to get uncomfortable. I have to be around 
uncomfortable wealth that I can't even imagine just yet. I have to be in different locations. I have to facilitate that. But you talked there a minute about a minute ago about the quantum field. Like who exposed you to the quantum field and what? And can you just give a bit of an insight into the quantum field so they understand what you're talking about in that respect? Yeah. So Joe Dispenza, I know you did that event. Like I read a couple of his books and I watch a lot of his YouTube around uh, that. And I think there's a there's a couple of other people's books I've read that are part of the same community as Joe Dispenza, but the the name uh, is mistaken me. But I first learned about it through an old old mentor of mine called Peter Sage, and uh, he was like one of Tony Robbins's. Uh, coaches I'm, i know he's got thousands of coaches and that was like the first event i went to where it was like full-on high energy everyone in the room like 12 hours jumping up and down and feel good and that it's like a vibration a vibration of energy changes your state yeah change changes state. the state of mind so like and then i learned like the training of like how to change the state of mind like that like getting in the zone with your, your breathing your mindset the goal and look at the end goal and that's what got me into that. And then one of my favorite books is uh, Reality Transurfing by Vadim Zeeland. I don't know if you've heard of that I've book. I've heard of that book. The book's like this big on Amazon, but I would definitely recommend checking it out. I think that would, I would call that as like the Bible of like the energy fields and how pendulums work. So he talks about pendulums in that book of like negative energy or when everything happened with the pandemic and everything, that everyone was stuck in that pendulum of fear and down and illness and everything else. And it, it walks you through how to get out being stuck and getting stuck cycle, into other people's pendulums, cycle, yeah. yeah. It's the same with people with negative energy. You know, when you walk in a room, you can sense someone's got neg- negativity around and them, it, and, it, and, it, and, and it's polarizing. Yeah, 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 positive, negative. You feel it straight away, yeah. and that's what makes you realize like how we are just energy, and and how important being around high vibrant people are. Like the same when I select like my girlfriend or partner, like she always has to have like high like vibrancy, like good feminine energy. You can always tell. And it's always a trade-off between, I know you've seen one of the books I was reading, uh, The Way of the Superior Man. Yeah. He talks around the masculine and feminine energy and how like, if you're high masculine, you need a, a real good feminine to balance the, the polarization, yeah, 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 yeah. to blend together. And that's very important as well with energy, even in relationships as well. Because where there's darkness, there's light. Yeah. Where there's where there's you know everything has polarity. There has to be has to be positive to be negative. There has to be negative to be positive. You know that, that's just the way of the world, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Too many people miss that. You don't have to get indoctrinated into that though. But it's it's, it's 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 right what you said there about the pendulum. You can get caught in other people's pendulums, and what happens is you, you can walk into someone's sphere of energy and then get pulled into their problem. I mean, there's been many times in the past where I've I've sat there at the end of a day and I've gone, I've I've gone to see someone who's perhaps not in the best state, and then I sit there at the end of the day and I think, why do I feel so taken on? So, yeah. because, taken because, on because yeah, I've just taken on, I've just taken on the, all their crap. I've yeah. just taken all, all on like all their opinions, all their doubts. This is why you are so impressionable as a child between the ages of zero and eight seven years old, eight, yeah. seven or eight years old. You take on all of your parents. Um, views, opinions, mm. habits, um, misdemeanors. Because you have ninety five percent of those habits and that personality is instilled between zero and seven, isn't it? Yeah, and, and but this, this is why you ha- this is why when you get to the age that we're at, the reason why you have the success that you have is because you've questioned every narrative mm. that James was brought up with in Newcastle. Because James, who's brought up in Newcastle, was probably brought up, you know middle class kid mm. kicked the football around you see you see your you have a comfortable life because you look down the road and there's some run down houses where there is with where there's lower 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 affluent people there so you in your area now are faced with the you think that having the three bedroom house and the BMW on the driveway is success because you're looking down the road now at people in a lot worse situation than you and then you get comfortable right yeah we said this before and it's interesting and i never thought about it like that about how uh, successful people if you come from a really poor upbringing i.e you had nothing and you had no heating and like you were really really poor those people sometimes it's a little bit easier it's not easier to get richer but like the polarity and like the suffering is like there's no comparison whereas like lower middle class so just middle class because you brought up in a bubble of comfort, you could earn 50k a year, get a mortgage, get a house, get married, have two kids, stay in this education system. Like every that's the that's the worst 
part of being like is being a middle class because it's very hard to get out of that. It's harder than yeah. when you've got nothing. Like you just you're just putting in the, the sweat, you're putting in the hustle because like it's only upside from there. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a tiny little bit of comfort and you could stay okay. That's why 90 to 95% of people don't change because they're okay being where they're at. Yeah, because the middle class There's is no pain, there's no suffering as much. It's the same when I bring on people in uh, our educational program. The only way we would bring them on is they need to have been through setting up a business. They need to understand where the flows are. Like they're lacking not being able to get enough clients or make enough placements or make enough money. They've got to, under, they've, they've got to have went through that first because we can't sell, not as a case of sell because we are helping them, but they've got to feel the pain. Like, if there's no pain, there's no reward and no upside. Yeah. If, they're, if, if they're saying, oh, well, I'm making 20K a month, I'm doing okay, I'm fine, I've got a few leads coming in. Sometimes, even though I could help them get to 100K a month, it's very hard for me to make them see that without feeling the pain. But then that person will come to me in six months and say, actually, James, we've only had, we've had a poor month last month, we've done zero or now 5K feel the pain. for the last two months, and now my wife's on at me, and now like I'm struggling, Like I really need help now then someone's going to commit to change and take action. Yeah. And it's the same with, uh, you see the studies around people uh, that might get cancer, lung cancer from smoking or a problem with drinking or whatever and say your liver's going to fail if you stop drinking. Like Some people will make that change, but it's funny people fall back to their default. I think the studies, because I was looking up this, and because um, I had a member from my family had a heart attack a couple of years ago, and I think that was down to like smoking and in not having a good diet and stuff. And obviously then they, they went to change. They like, bought them lots of different vitamins and stuff to do. But it's very hard for them, like, if they've lived a life for so long in that, those habits, daily habits, people just fall back to their default that they used to because it's so hard to change now and there's so much effort to, to adapt. Even the when a doctor says, you've got six months left to live or die if you have another cigarette, most people still smoke the cigarette. Like, why is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy. Like, I, 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 mate, I was on a, a pattern and a path of energy drinks. Of, you know, dr- they compound. Mm-hmm. Everything compounds that you do. But the, but the, it's right what you're saying and what we're talking about before is the middle class. Is that when you're, when you're in this middle class band, the band that, you know, perhaps in Australia earns 80 to 100K a year, the, the band in England that probably earns you 35 to 50k a year. When you're in that band, when you've got the BMW on the driveway or the, or the Merc, mm. the C-Class, when you've got the, you know, you've got, the, you've got a little bit of spare cash to do everything you want to do in your daily life, that is the, that is the worst place to be. Because when you've got nothing and you've got zero on your, on your ass, you've got no other place to go other than up mm. because you can't go any further, right? Because you've hit rock bottom. But when you're in that middle class band, it just that is so comfortable it can talk you have time and enough money and enough resources to talk yourself out of your own fucking dreams Mm -hmm. because you sit there on your couch watching your massive tv or with netflix on your 15 inch tv in your nice apartment because you've got enough money now and you're like oh yeah i don't want to i don't really want to burn all my ships here, take the risk. I don't want to take the risk of moving to Dubai. I don't want to take the risk of moving to Australia. I don't want to take the risk of moving to the UK because you're so comfortable. In comfortable you're yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing when you see the middle class and then they might start a business and I could have just stayed where I was comfortable and I would have breeded that success. And I think that falls down to the default of, because you don't want to go below the middle class of your upbringing. So sometimes there's a fear of like, oh, well, if I take more risk, then what if I lose it all? And I don't know what losing it all means to be. Yeah, you know, because, like be- with nothing. Because, of, because I've never had what... Like the, right at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, I've never been Whereas right at Whereas you bottom. see the people right, right, right at the bottom with zero, they take even bigger risks because they're like, fuck, I lived on a sofa or I lived homeless yeah. or I did this and that. So they can take bigger risks to 100, 200, 300 million because they, they didn't have the comfort and so, as such. And so sometimes it is a... Like I said, it's harder for them to get started, but it's it's easier in a way in some ways, like because they didn't have the blessing of like some sort of level of security or comfort. May I challenge every thought in my head and a lot of the thoughts in in my mind and all of my mannerisms and stuff like that have come from a middle class mentality, mm. and they all need to be quashed over time to be able to ascend and to move forward. And I'm still quashing them now, mate. At 34 years old, like yeah, we all are, we, we're all battling them, like. There's no, there's no separation here from anyone that's listening to what me and you are fighting through ourselves in our own lives because we're still, in order for you to get this software as a service business to the level that you want to talk to, 
you are going to have to break some patterns that are probably instilled when you were 10 yeah, years it's old. It's true, because I don't need to take that risk. That's the thing. Like, Because it, it's comfortable, right? It's comfortable, yeah. And, but this is why Dubai has been important to me, because I am poor here. Like, even having a Rolls Royce Lamborghini, having nice watches... It's like that's just that's the middle class here. I am just middle yeah, class yeah, in yeah, Dubai. Yeah, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna say that you've just yeah. moved your middle class. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, to be fair, so it's my new default comfort zone. Yeah, but it's upgraded. So then, it, then it's like I still, then I can still aspire to have more because this is just like, it's default now. See, my 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 opinion on the whole whole debacle is, I believe that everyone has to leave the area that they grow up. Agree for at least five five years at least to get yourself completely out of the area you grew up. You can't be around um, the friends that you grew up. You can't be around your family. You got to be, got to take yourself away in order to do the work. You got to take yourself away in order to do the healing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of healing that has to happen. Like being alone is important. Like being in a, like I moved here with no, no friends, no one. Like it was by myself and it was a big shock because I grew up like my office and business I built like right next door to where my family are, my brothers, friends, so everyone was in one community and a dog that I loved that I had with an ex-partner that I shared. So I sacrificed everything to come here and it gave me, I've grown a lot. Like I have changed a lot over the last two years being here, but in a good way. But then people, if you go back home, people will be like, oh, James has changed. James is this and that. And it's like, yeah, I have changed, but you haven't. Yeah, yeah. It's, pretty, it's projected because it, it's programmed. People aren't supposed to change, and then so when you go back home, they're like, "Oh, James, you're this and that." Like back to how you normally used to be. Like they're trying. Sometimes uh, I was watching an interview with Alex Omozi on YouTube, which was good. Why he doesn't go home for Christmas? And it was because his parents and everyone else are like they still treat Alex as the old Alex that wasn't really successful and was just this guy, and he hates it because he gets put back in this box of like how he used to be. And I think sometimes when you go back to your hometown or whatever, they try and think you're going to be the same as what you were before. Yep. And then you end up pre-programming back to that default. And sometimes you take a few backward steps. And that's what happened to me even a few months ago. I went back uh, home in the office. And I remember I just wasn't inspired. I wasn't productive. I was going back to the old routine. and Because then you was, like, you're putting on old clothes and comfort and everything else. And I was like, I need to get back to Dubai. And every time I go back to the UK, I'm I'm less there and more yeah. in Dubai because yeah. I because I can see it sucking me back in and back into an old default, and that's really important. Why you said you need to break out of your hometown, and I really agree with that. I don't think you can be ultra successful. Very very few people will if they stay in their hometown and don't break free from what their what their previous environment was because you've got to have a new environment in order to help with the change. Yeah, this is this this one is very relevant because what you're speaking into now is something that I'm going through with myself. With where, you know, I don't actually know. Part of me thinks I oh, lower your cost of living, pump pump more into everything that you're doing, capitalize on the back end, live in the UK, and then part of me thinks, well, actually, would you be better off living in Dubai? You know, do you know what I mean? And forcing yourself to let go to the next level or would you be better off going to Miami or would you be better off going somewhere else like it's a real it's a real hard internal conversation that even I'm having mate mm-hmm. do you know what I'm saying I know you, have, you probably have an opinion on it but yeah. it's hard isn't it it's hard mm. to it's hard to know but I, I, I fully I fully get what you're saying when you go back to the place you grew up it's really hard not to fall back into some old elements of your life even though you've created new realities in your mind mm. isn't that isn't that isn't it isn't it isn't it powerful how your mind can identify where you were and go, oh, let's just slap that program back on. Let's just slap those triggers back in. Let's just re- reiterate some of these things that come through in your life. What are some of the things that you're working on right now in this moment that you've, you've identified that need to kind of be fixed in order to facilitate that next move? There must be some, some, mm, some well, In terms of mindset or just yeah, business? Yeah, mind, mindset, yeah. Because it's predominantly a mindset that's going to take you to that next level now. Yeah, it's, it's new goals. I'll be honest. I've achieved everything on my vision board. So if I look back, if the person I needed to become five years ago and everything that I wanted, I've got everything I wanted. Like I've got a good multiple seven figures in the bank account. I've got all of the best watches, my favorite cars, great apartment, great friendship group, two yeah. great businesses, uh, healthy family back home. Like I've got, 
I've got everything on paper, but it's like now is time to reset. So now I'll be honest, like the last few months I've took a little bit of time just to self-reflect and think, okay, so what I haven't pushed myself in terms of what is my next challenge, but I think being around all of uh, the inspiring friendship group, I could have just like retired for a couple of years if I wanted to, or just kept those businesses doing okay. But now like my other friends are making 20 million in a year or like a hundred million exit. It's like, I'm, I'm behind now you, know, you yeah, were saying yeah, to me yeah. so that's just that's in the niggling in the back of my mind that forces me to grow more and then uh yeah and then recently got like uh involved in a, a new relationship and she's like really ambitious and that's inspired me more to to grow because i want bigger and better things like i do want eventually maybe to have a yacht one day i do want to be able to even be on a bigger scale and have a build a family and build um build fill the businesses so now i'm just red i can feel my my mind's like charged back up to go like now is the time for nine figures over the next three or four or five years and it's a mixture between SaaS and probably acquiring companies because there's, i think there's a difference between being an entrepreneur and a startup entrepreneur and then actually owning corporations and buy buying and rolling up companies and exiting and i've always been excited about that business like one of my old mentors i was saying was dan pena the 50 billion dollar yeah, man yeah, yeah, yeah. So i spent eight days as it is castle and, and i've done a lot of uh courses around acquisitions but i haven't done that yet because again you only have so much time and distraction focus on the one one thing first in terms of one business which i built solidly for five six years then i focus on the next business most people go wrong because once i've had a little bit of success in year one year two they're like oh, i'm going to start another business like why double down on the business you've got and get it to a certain level first. Yeah. But now I'm at a stage where eventually like my end goal is to have a private equity firm where I invest in businesses, roll them up and sell them and acquire, build and acquire. So that between the SaaS company and uh, private equity is like my 15, 20 year vision. One thing I've noticed though, is that the relationship for you came when you were at a point in your life when you were reflecting. Yeah. Right. And you and your relationship also came at a point in your life when you said that you'd achieved everything you'd want to on your vision board. Mm. So as as a young man and, and advice to other young men that are chasing dreams and chasing goals, are, would you say that it's better to facilitate those goals happening on your own to start with? Or 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 what's your what's your mindset on that? That's a good question. One of my other friends was asking this before as well because I, I most of the time throughout my journey I've been in relationships. I've had single stages like I was like yeah. for the last few months and a couple of years ago as well. But I think because he was asking, he was like, James, do you make more money in a relationship or more money single? And the question's interesting. So what I would say was, uh, you've got more stability in a relationship, so you so you more in a routine in terms yep. of your business then you've got the good balance of health wealth love happiness and everything else so i would say you're more consistent with uh, being in a relationship and having a partner to support you and pick you up and help you grow but then you don't have the freedom when you're single you don't have the freedom and autonomy and you don't have as it's weird as it sounds you don't have as bigger goals so when i like the times when i've been single I've been like, right, I'm going to smash it, get the 250 million, I'm going to do this, this and this, I'm going to travel here, there and everywhere, and we're going to do this. And So you have, because you've just got so much freedom, it's just you and business and you're just so centered to focus. But when you've got someone else, it's like, well, okay, well, if we get to 30, 40 million and have this and this, build a family, and be ha- I'll be happy and comfortable. Because yeah. it does take you a little bit more to the comfort. Uh, but then also when you're single, it is a little bit more uh, sometimes soulless and it's like, well, what am I doing all of this for? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I know in the back of my mind, and it's been in my gut. You said a gut feeling before. I know at some point I need to have kids soon. I feel like that's the next thing that's missing. Is like, do I put all of that and en- emptiness or energy into just building another company or scaling even more faster, or do I like now? Is it is it a time now to have a family and do what's supposed to be done? But I had the, I had the internal dialogue in Australia. I was sat there literally. It was 15 days ago and I thought, I was, I was questioning myself about what I was doing because I'd just put my car up for auction, which is a tie and I love the car and I just handed in the notice on the apartment and I'm having, I'm sat there and I'm having the internal dialogue. Oh, but I've been here eight years. I love this country. I love it. I feel about a lot. I, I, I love Australia. And I, this, this, the podcast I do is a service to England and Australia. Do you know what I mean? There's a bit of, there's a bit of that in it. But I'm sat there and I'm like, 
but Frankie, you've been there. This is my head talking. You've been there eight and a half years. You've not got a missus or a dog. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Yeah. It's in my, that's what my head's telling me. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, like, why don't I have a missus? Like, if, to me, the, my mindset was, if you don't have a missus or a dog after eight and a half years in a place, you're in the wrong place. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's the way my yeah. mind, the mindset was working on it. I don't like, think Dubai's going to be any different, mind. Yeah, yeah, the, the Dubai's so. not the place you come for a missus and a dog, but, but like, the, the, the that, that, that's just the way that I justified it to my own self. I mean, you, that, there are times when you think to yourself as a man who's in the pursuit of a goal, a vision, a vision bigger than himself, which you and I both are at different levels. When you are in the pursuit of that goal, it would be nice if there was someone on the journey with you to kind of to kind of just be your, your wingman. Yeah, kind I of think thing. so. Like throughout my journey, when I started my business, I was with my ex fiance. Uh, or I was with her for eight years and I had a dog and I had a house and we like went a bit in the house. So the, my whole goal of like originally building the, my first business was get enough money to build and renovate this house and make it nice yeah. and then live a nice life. But she supported me a lot. So she went through a lot of hard times with me when I started off with the anxiety and then helped me throughout the years. So I think that was a good, because if I look back, if I was single back then, the problem with being single when you're building the business is if you are a guy and you like women, then you're not just going to be focused 100% on business, let's be honest. You're no, going to be on Instagram, be there, DMing yeah. girls, you're going to be taking girls on dates every weekend. It's tiring. And that is more distracting and costs you more money than having someone law that's at home with you. So I think there's a disparity between, like, uh, say, the Andrew Tate views of um, get your money right first, I agree with. And because you need to be a high-value man or to be of something of worth, you need to go and create your net worth first. So I yeah. get that. But there's a balance between like the younger uh, male, males out there in the audience. It's hard for them because they need to make money to attract a better female. Otherwise, they won't be able to take the alpha role in a relationship. But then also you, you need someone there to support you throughout a journey, but they might just be there for that part of the journey, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then as you like make more money, what, you see that with divorce. Like All billionaires get divorced. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff, like Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, Jeff like Bezos got the Gary book. Vaynerchuk, like yeah. all of them do. And I say this all of the time. So, but they Jeff all had Gary. a partner. They all had a wife or partner yeah. from the startup. Like every successful person, most likely had uh, a partner with them. But then they all got yeah. See, divorced. even 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 the founder of Reebok, Joe, mm-hmm. he had he had a he had a wife through the build stage of his business, and then obviously broke up with her, and then got another girlfriend who's been with for like 10 years now that's that's kind of after the after after the Reebok kind mm-hmm. of thing do you know after the sale so I have noticed that and it's like Gary, Gary V and, and Bezos they got they they both got jacked and got new new younger models like and yeah. and and spicy spicy things on their arms like <laughs> there's no there's no doubt about that it's just it's just it's just a, just something that you can it's, pl- it's in plain sight you can see it I just kind of think you, that it, it would be nice to have someone on the journey with you that kind of that kind of sees your vision. But I kind of also think that when you're as driven as what me and you are, or driven as some of the people that listen to this podcast, whether you're a man or a woman, when you're, when you're as driven, you need, you need someone who takes a back seat to be able to, to facilitate that. You can't, you can't be with one, with someone who's, who's trying to have another dick in the relationship because you're just going to get, you're just going to get totally bamboozled by it. And it's kind of that. Yeah. Know. They need to be supportive. And know that like you're the one out there making sacrifices and putting the blood, sweat, and tears in, and they're just there to nurture you and support you. So, yeah, like I definitely think if I had to pick, I would to be successful. Like when you first start out, I think being in a relationship is is better. It, like the pros and cons, like it's better to have someone to support you going for sure. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's mad, but I kind of. I think that there are times in my life where if I'd been in stable relationships, I would have saved myself a hell of a lot of time mm. because you can't be out there playing the field, doing the thing, being the lad, all this stuff. Cause that, that there just takes so much energy out of so you much energy, yeah. and draining mm-hmm. and the time and the, the late nights. Cause you've gone on a date and all this kind of stuff. It's just, and Dubai, Dubai single life is like that. And it's, more amplified because the more money you've got you can do that pretty much every night if you wanted to like you can go through stages of just dating a girl every single night taking them back and dating them messaging like there's so much energy but it, it costs you so much money and time and lost time and it's like what are you doing it for 
it is empty. Like you get to, you can go through stages of it, but over time, I'm, I, I know because I am in tune, like with my spiritual side, and I and I know that is something that I'm going to be working on more over the next couple of years is more my spiritual awakening again. Because I went through that at the start of the business journey, but then sort of lost its path a little bit. What was the awakening moment? Um, definitely for me when I started like meditating more and. You mentioned uh, Aubrey Marcus. I followed him for a long time, and I'm keen to do an ayahuasca retreat at some point. Yeah, soon. I feel like I'm ready for that now, and I feel like there's. Have you done mushrooms? No, but I know you need to start on that first. Really, I think I think well, mushrooms call you. Mm. They call you. They 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 contain a lot of wisdom. But I think I think I think the the progression for me that as far as it, for me going through was mushrooms. Then I'd probably do DMT mm. because that would probably what's what would be the next thing that's calling me, and then I'd probably go I ask her after that. Me, or my personal. Have you journey. done DMT? Or no, I've never done DMT, but I kind of I kind of think to myself, if I can see as much as I've seen on these mushroom journeys, I think I'd be open to do DMT because, and this is from someone I've never took a recreational drug. I've never took cocaine or none of this other stuff that most people have taken. I've never even drank alcohol, but I just look at. Uh, the things that I've seen on mushroom trips are mad. Mm-hmm. I did one, James, right? And I saw my, I did one just before I went on tour of the UK last time. And I saw everything that happened in the tour in the mushroom trip. And it was, there's only one, there's only like 5% of, there's only 5% of what I did in the UK on that tour that I hadn't already foreseen in the mushroom wow. trip. Never told anyone that, but yeah. it's just, it was mental. That's mate. what I'd like to see. I just want to see a little bit into the future. Like, I know, like, ayahuasca trips, people have said they've seen, like, what the kids are going to be like, what the journey is like. They see see you, like, 10, 20 years in advance. And I think I'm intrigued by that. When we talk about the quantum field and when we talk about going through the levels of consciousness, mm-hmm. there's there's obviously other consciousness and other, other universes, other levels to this life at, at, at different period, periodizations. And you're just kind of, it, it, it takes you out of your body and shows you, shows you yourself in a totally different light i remember going on a mushroom trip and i don't know what i was worried about but it took me out of my body and i had a had a massive ego death around needing to prove things to other people yeah. and it took it t- all of a sudden i didn't need to prove anything anymore and i'm like what so, so you're telling me that with a five gram hero dose of mushrooms that costs whatever it costs, plus a journey, which is going to cost you like probably five, six hundred dollars by the time you finish. That You can be in a controlled environment. You can be taken out of yourself, see yourself from a different perspective and then come back and, in, and, and integrate and, and be a, and see seeing from a totally different perspective. To me, it's like if you use mushrooms for the right, for that reason, yeah. the reason why all ancient civilizations use them, you can, you can facilitate a lot of growth. Do you think that changed you at all? Or you just 100%. got more awareness with, the I, ego. I, ch- I change every day. I change, you change every day. Like, because w- me and you are in the pursuit of these 1% things that move us in the right direction. I think that is the, that is the whole purpose of what, what we're what A lot we're of uh, billionaires take LSD, don't they? Yeah, the, yeah LSD, um, DMT, ayahuasca, mushrooms. And the reason they're illegal... Yeah, well, we know... Because they don't want because to. because they don't <laughs> want you to they don't want you, they don't want you, no because you raise your you raise your consciousness and you open your pineal gland and you can see more yeah. because your third eye here third eye chakra it, it, when you open that up that is a and and then you open up the the connection to to hey I'm telling you now there is there is no doubt in my mind that there is more to this life than what you'll ever see unless you go and open up yourself yeah, to I these agree. things. But there, but again, with what I'm saying on this podcast to you and to the, everyone else that's listening at this point, what I'm saying is, I didn't go into mushrooms. Mushrooms called me. Yeah. So there was a pro- the, the process, like you talked about in the business, was the process for spirituality with me. It started with needing to talk to someone, then found breath work, then found meditation, and then it went on that journey and healed f- lot through that, and then I found mushrooms, and then you know you find other things off the back of that. Eventually, I'll I'll try dmt and other things like you don't you don't just go and you don't need to go and start mushrooms if you've never done meditation or you've never done um 
the, the breath work because you need to learn how to listen to your gut intuition to be able to facilitate you being able to yeah. yeah because otherwise how are you going to learn from a mushroom trip when you can't even listen to yourself and your gut True. it's mental mate mm-hmm. i think that's the next thing for you mate. yeah that's i'm gonna, looking forward to it that's gonna open that's gonna open you up and i tell you now you when you do it you'll probably see certain things that you might want to do in business or do d- differently you hadn't seen from a different perspective yeah. it's going to be exciting yeah i'm excited I, I'm, I might i might i might figure out who in dubai does these journeys for you mate and get your teeth up no one in dubai do them yeah well you're, allowed, you're, you're not allowed here but like you can go probably be like mexico or peru or no you can you can you can fly over to um amsterdam get it done amsterdam is a place to go and i'd do want it. to see like a proper shaman though i'd want to go like to a proper resort i think there's another one in uh Puerto Rico or somewhere as well. That was yeah. looking at. There's a, there's a lot. There's Amsterdam, Puerto Rico. There's Costa Rica. There's there's Brazil. You can do all these kind of different things. But I just I think it's something that it depends what what stage you're in life. But if you're if you if you're at a stage where you want to access new levels of yourself and you've tried breath, you try meditation. It's it's definitely the next route that calls you in. Mm. But you, it is very much a call. It calls you. It yeah. calls you. You know. Do you meditate? Yeah, yeah, but I don't. But I, I do, I don't, so I used to meditate every day, do breath work every day, do all these different things every day, had this routine, but the routine was lasting too long. And I realized that because I'd made it such a routine, I was, I was trying to force the results. Mm -hmm. So what I do now is I like, I'm, I'm, I do either the meditation or the breath work or, or some form of other self work every day i do a piece of it every day but i don't hold myself to today i, I can feel okay today i need to breathe mm. uh because i got i feel oh, why do i feel so tense i need to breathe today or oh, i need to i need to think i need to get into my mind i need to understand myself a bit more oh maybe i meditate today yeah do you see what i'm saying you kind of you feel out what you need for that day and then you 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 you, you do some kind of self-care practice but self-care can be reading a book you might need to yeah, fill your mind journaling yeah yeah journaling is so good mm-hmm. is journaling something you've done for a long period long time yeah so i've uh, actually got probably five or six like full journals done now like pretty much journaled all the way my journey of the last seven eight years because eventually i want to write a autobiography book and i think it's good because you date like how you're feeling at the time what happened in your business what's happening in your personal life your fitness financial everything and ideas and thoughts and it's so interesting to look back over what were you doing this time two years ago how were you feeling where was your level of success what were your daily habits that you were doing what were you thinking about i think it's really interesting to see the change because then you again you're training your mind if like see it does work like this is who james used to be this is who james is now and you it, it just reinforces everything that you instilled with the daily habits that created where you are now and it was always interesting to look back because I used to always do that, uh, the graph where you would rate, I would always rate out of 10. Okay, so what's my health like at the moment? Yeah, the wheel, the, wheel, the, wheel the, wheel of, of, the wheel of fortune. Wheel of life or something. Yeah, wheel yeah. of life, yeah, yeah. And I used to rate everything. And always like personal development was 10. Like finance was 7 or 8. Like business was like 9 or 10. Personal development, friendship group. But there was always like friendship group and... Um, then maybe not putting enough in a relationship or what have you. Like there was always because there's always sacrifices, especially when you go into business. Like you're going to be dedicated to that. So it probably comes back to the relationship. Being up, you probably you, you can't give ten out of ten in a relationship when you when you grow in an empire for sure. It's a it's a, tri- it's a tricky one because that wheel of life um, that you're talking about, where you rate yourself in like ten areas on a on a one to ten basis. The the whole point you mark that out truly and honestly is because it shows you that if you're not if the wheel isn't round it doesn't spin right and that's that that's 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 to envision in that's to show you that how life is so in fact with the wheel of life you're actually better off at being fives in everything and being round so the wheel rolls down the road in the right direction than you are being a 10 in one thing and a three in another in certain areas because the wheel can't move round Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of how it was explained to me when I was when I was doing it. So you, you and then you kind of eke out the fives to all sixes, and then this that and the other. I would agree to a certain point, but then I would also say just get them like if you're gonna be high on one thing, definitely f- like money, like Do- double down, it. double down. Because when you you see in one of the books that I read, uh, Naval Ravikant, one of my favorite books, so great author. 
But he says, get the mo- like for happiness, get the money right first. Yeah. And then focus on being happy later. Like happiness can come as a byproduct of like creating wealth. Yeah. But everything, everything you believe in your heart, if you're telling someone now what to do, it would be get your money right first, get them, get the wealth first. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's what, that's, that's the pivotal thing that's really changed your life. And the only way that will do that is your mindset and personal development. So just learning. Because I wasn't academically very good at school. Like, I'm not really clever. But I just put more hours. You know, like the 10,000 hour rule? Like, I put yeah. in 10,000 hours more in, say, recruitment. 10,000 hours more in uh, online education and how to teach others. 10,000 hours in just learning around business, yeah. mindset, and everything else. So I think the, that just compounds over time. And it's like a five-year lag, and then all of a sudden, like, you get ultra success. So I would say everyone just needs to... People don't, like, read enough books or watch enough YouTube or learn... Like, even when, I was, when I say watch YouTube, there's billionaires doing interviews. There's people that like, made mul- yeah. multi-million pound exits. Just listen to their podcasts or listen to their story, yeah. like, over time. And then it'll just be breeding in. You're learning from all of these other successful people. And it's free. Like, there's so much free resources. But people, people say they do it, but they don't. Like, even... People that want to be successful will reach out to me. I'm like, well, watch this, this, and this. And, but I'm still doing that five hours a day, and I don't have to do it. I do it out of just pure pleasure and enjoyment and because I want to keep improving. Yeah. Whereas can, that's why people can't catch up to me like in my sectors because I'm still putting in those extra yards just to learn more, 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 more. And then because the flywheel effect, it's just getting faster and faster. And that's why success needs breeds, breeds more success. Like the more success that you get and the more you keep putting into that flywheel of like the daily habits, the rituals, the learning, the personal development, then the faster it'll just, it, it's just more easier. And it's easier to make, it's hard to make your first million, it's easier to get to 10 million and to 100 because everything's just compounded. Because yeah, you, you, you've already got the wheel moving, which is, it's getting the wheel moving and greasing the wheel. And people quit, yeah, they don't do enough. They think, oh, well, I've read one book, it didn't work for me, or I've done some affirmations, I haven't got my dream apartment or house. But it's just doing that over time consistently for like years is what it takes yeah I love it mate I love it and if there's one piece of advice one pearl of wisdom that you could leave this audience with that you know you can't you can't leave the cars you can't leave anything else but you could just leave one pearl of wisdom available to everyone that listens to this what would it be yeah for, for me it would be not to worry what other people think and the perception of like what other people view of you because when you think people are thinking about you they're, everyone's self obsessed they're only thinking about themselves so when you remove the stigma of like your ego of like worrying what other people think if you fail or do this or that, just forget about that and just go like take action and go for like your dreams because we only get one life. Life is so precious and people waste a way of like finding excuses. If you want to do something, like you'll do it. If you don't want to do it, you'll find an excuse. I love it, mate. I love it. And that guys is James Blackwell and mate, I appreciate you coming on, being the first Thank podcast you, back in Dubai with the new setup. I was I was a bit dubious about this new setup, but you know, really I, cool. it's good, guys. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and got a lot out of it. And I just want to say to you all, I appreciate every one of you that listens. And if you could just share this content with two, three other people, drop it in the girls, all the boys WhatsApp groups. You know what I mean? Just share it around, help make this movement go further. It, it, it all helps, you know, like just getting people telling other people that's that's where the podcast grows and i hope that you got as much value out of this as i've got out of hosting it and mate i wish you every success in the future and guys much love guys do me a solid favor drop a comment below this video and let us know who you want on the podcast next